good to see you again. I hope that you've had a wonderful time with Pastor Daniel in my absence, and I'm happy to be back here with you after spending a few days visiting friends in Michigan. I love going to places, um, but it's also good to spend uh, some vacation days going back to the places that we've been, places from our history. Because visiting awakens old memories. The few days in Michigan were like flipping through an old photo album. Driving through each intersection brought to mind different events that reminded me of the work that our family did there, the lessons that God brought, um, and the uh, good food that we ate. The best part was revisiting all the old restaurants where we were able to remember past conversations, past moments of grace. As we ate, the memories of all of that came flooding back, and it was a good time to celebrate God's faithfulness as we thought about what changed and what stayed the same. I hope that in your travels that God's grace is upon that as well. Of course, traveling is always exhausting, and one way to get many of the benefits of traveling without all, of the, uh, without all the energy is to host people that you haven't seen in a while. I look forward to doing that with my older brother and his family as they resettle here in the New York City area. They spent the last four years uh, in California near the rest of my mother's side of the family, and they've recently traveled to Korea, visiting folks on my dad's side of the family. And so as he comes, I'm looking forward to catching up with them. I've already clicked through his photo dump on Facebook. I have an idea about who he's been with, but I look forward to hearing from him how they're doing. I'm sure there will be much to celebrate, um, but I'm also sure there will be some sobering news. How old is grandma now? How is she doing? You know, that aunt looks sick. Is she doing okay? Because reconnecting is not just about hearing good news, but also being reminded of the struggles that others that we love are going through. Asking how people are doing is a risky thing. It's also a loving thing. Because learning about their hardships and feeling the weight of their burdens and keeping people in their thoughts and prayers is a choice that we must make. Recently, I've been thinking about that phrase, you're in my thoughts and prayers. The overuse of this phrase has been called out in recent years for being a cheap way to signal your virtue without doing anything. After all, many people who don't actually pray will say, you're in my thoughts and prayers, when they mean, I read your post and I responded to it for like a second. But if you are actually taking the time to think and pray, I think that it's actually one of the most meaningful and loving things that we can do. It means that you're processing the news of the other person, you're thinking about it and praying for their needs, asking for God to bless them, and wondering if God will somehow call you to be a part of that help. When you actually take time to think about people in hardship, significant things will begin to happen, the first of which is that you will develop a poverty of spirit. Jesus says, the poor you shall always have with you, and he didn't mean that there would always be some poor people in the world. Jesus was saying, if you take my word seriously, if you love the other people around you the way I'm calling you to love them, then you will always have poor people in your circle of care. There will always be people that you love whose needs you cannot meet, whose problems you cannot solve, and this will cause you to approach our Heavenly Father with knees bent and hands outstretched with true poverty of spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. God, my, my reflex is to try to save my loved ones so that I can feel like I'm in control, I can feel powerful. But what can I say in response to their problems when they're just as smart as me? What can I do when I'm already burdened with my responsibilities, when I feel like I'm barely getting by? I admit that I don't know how to help. Many of my motives for even wanting to help are selfish, are rooted in pride. I, I spend time thinking about them and praying for them. I do so because they're my family, and you've told us to go through our lives bearing witness to each other, cheering for each other and mourning together. And I wish I could do more, so I bring this desire before you. This, this love, I feel, this is a fraction of the heart that you have for them. And I know that you are the one who loves them most. You are the one who is wise. You have all the power and resources. So God, would you please do what only you can do? We remember Jesus 
and trust that you who gave your son would not withhold anything good from any of us. So in his name, would you meet our needs? When you're actually thinking about and praying for the people that you love, you are doing a loving thing. You are witnessing the journey of other people, and you're asking for the only Savior to move on their behalf. Don't dismiss being in somebody else's thoughts and prayers, because when we pray, God moves. Amen? Amen. And it's only when God moves first and prompts and guides our response that we can respond and help in a loving way, a truly helpful way. If I move in response to somebody's urgent need that they shared, then my action can come across as anxious and overbearing or proud and condescending. Or even if the person happily receives the help I give, we might receive resentment as we wonder why we are the ones that have to help again and again. But if we first pray and then move in response to God's command, according to God's plan, then God will use our participation for his good and powerful ways. That's when our response will not signal our virtue, but it will point to God's glorious provision. So friends, today I want to recover that concept of being in each other's thoughts and prayers. That phrase is not camouflage for selfish passivity, No, our thinking and praying for others is the humble and faith-filled act that God waits for before God moves with power and might. So when we pray like Nehemiah, we will understand that giving our thoughts and prayers, it doesn't replace our other actions. Rather, thinking and praying, it frees us from being manipulated by others and from manipulating others unconsciously by purifying all of our actions and positioning us all under the leadership of God. As we journey through Nehemiah through the month of September, may we begin praying like Nehemiah so that God can use us the way God used Nehemiah. Would you join me in praying before we approach our text? Dear God, some of us are often manipulated roped into doing things for others that they should be doing. Others of us are growing too distant, and we are growing lonely as we maintain our distance from the people that are struggling. And all of us need your guidance so that we can be filled with your life and your vitality, and so that our relationships can be marked by your love. So now, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be made holy and pleasing to you, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, and we'll be picking up with chapter 2 and so on from Monday to Friday next week. I hope that you'll be joining in. These are the memoirs of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In late autumn, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Susa. Hanani, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some of the other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and distress. Disgrace. The walls of Jerusalem has been torn down, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. Then I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commandments, listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people, Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you gave us through your servant, Moses. Please remember what you told your servant, Moses. If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me, 
and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. The people that you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. O oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. In those days, I was the king's cupbearer. This is the word of the Lord. Today, we will study Nehemiah chapter 1 and explore what it means to pray like Nehemiah. Verse 1 tells us when Nehemiah lived and where he lived. These are the memoirs of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In late autumn, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Susa. So this is happening in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign is 445 BC. So 91 years before Nehemiah writes, a group of Israelites had left Babylon and the other cities where they were exiled to go back and resettle Israel. So these original rebuilders are able within the first 20 years to rebuild the temple of God. Through rebuilding the temple, they are able to get back to the rhythms of worship that God had commanded so they could grow in spirituality and grow in the knowledge of God. But after building the temple, they had hoped for more. Because in Israel's past, the building of a God-ordained place of worship resulted in God's presence causing their military and economic flourishing. The glory of God would cause the enemies of Israel to scatter, and that's what the rebuilders who came during the exile hoped for. As it was during the time of Moses, when God spoke to them in the tabernacle, when column of cloud by day and column of fire by night rested on their tabernacle, he wanted the glory of God to be with them. As it was during the golden age of the United Kingdom, when the glory of God rested on the temple, filling it so that everyone had to fall face down. The exiles had hoped that God would make them famous and prosperous. But even though God had commanded the rebuilding of this temple through Haggai the prophet, after they completed the work, God did not send down fire or fill it with glory. Why not? The answer is a little bit complicated. It will be studied in greater depth in the next two Friday Bible studies, so I hope that you'll come. But the simple answer is that during the exile, God spoke to the Israelites about the coming of the suffering servant, the coming of Jesus, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit through the prophet Ezekiel and Jeremiah, talking about the one who would turn our hearts of stone into hearts of flesh, who would write the law of God on our hearts. So the glory of God would be with the Israelites one day, not localized in the temple, but shining in the face of Jesus. And the fire of God would not fall just on the temple, but it would indwell every disciple who has faith in Jesus' name. But the rebuilders didn't know any of this, and it would be another almost 500 years for these messianic promises to be fulfilled. In the meantime, they were just disappointed that there was no revival in Jerusalem. So instead of showing the world that their God could be trusted, that their God should be adored, the Israelites who had returned to Jerusalem, they were mocked by their immediate neighbors and largely ignored as they struggled to just survive. As a result, about 50 years after the temple was rebuilt, Ezra the prophet went back to strengthen the people. He was sent with the blessing of King Artaxerxes, the same guy, who allowed him to take a lot of money and encouraged to take, for him to take many capable leaders so that the city of Jerusalem could be revitalized and the people recommit to worshiping God. So in Nehemiah chapter 1, the story is opening with a person who is curious about how life in Jerusalem is going 13 years after Ezra the prophet sent those reinforcements back to Jerusalem. Nehemiah is a Jew who is serving under King Artaxerxes in the fortress of Susa. Susa was the winter palace of the king. 
And so for him to be there in the fall means that he was in a position of great power and privilege. Nehemiah was serving 30 years after Esther was queen, and he was serving the Persian Empire during the time when the Jews were experiencing wide acceptance, perhaps similar to the way Asian Americans are experiencing general acceptance throughout America today. He is in that fortress of Susa, and verse 11 reveals that he was the cupbearer to the king, a man of high position in a powerful empire during a time when he did not have to hide his Jewish identity. But even though Nehemiah is comfortable in Susa, he is interested in what is happening in Israel. So his interest in Israel did not come from his desire to escape his life. Despite himself living the dream in Susa, verse 2 tells us Nehemiah was interested in what was happening in Jerusalem. So don't let helping others be a cover for you failing to handle your responsibilities. Don't let helping others be a form of your procrastination. That does not win God's approval, nor does it lead to healthy relationships. You must live your life and fulfill your responsibilities and calling first so that you can lovingly serve others with integrity. And that's when God will allow you to bless other people with opportunities to help them. Verse 2. Hanani, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things are going in Jerusalem. So we see here that Nehemiah first hosted. He hosted his brother Hanani, who was a part of that Rebuilding Jerusalem team. And before asking, how are things going?, he asked them, how about you crash with me tonight? Take a load off, wash up, and have a meal. Nehemiah first hosted before asking for the update, which tells us that hospitality should always precede curiosity about how things are going with that person. Nehemiah, after doing this in verse 3, we get to hear what he heard. They said to me, things are not going well, for those who returned to the province of Judah, they are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. So I'm sure Nehemiah, who was one of the most highly ranked Jews in the Persian Empire, 13 years ago, he had supported those who went to Jerusalem with Ezra. He had given to that cause. And after that big wave of people 13 years ago, there were probably a few people going back and forth between Jerusalem and Susa over the years. And I'm sure Nehemiah kept blessing them, serving them, and asking them about how the people in Jerusalem were doing. And Nehemiah keeps getting the same report. Things are not going well. They are in great trouble and disgrace. That's not what you hope to hear from the missionaries that you support. You want to hear about revival. You want to hear about hope and growth. You don't want to hear about trouble and disgrace. But Nehemiah, because he offers hospitality first, and because he honors those unconditionally who are doing God's work, he is trusted. So he gets the raw and honest update. And people tell him, our problem, we realize, is not that we need more money to be sent from Susa to fund the work in Jerusalem. We need someone to organize us to build a wall in Jerusalem so that through that investment in infrastructure, the city of Jerusalem might develop prosperity on its own without depending on donations from Susa. They're saying that pouring resources to revitalize Jerusalem is like trying to fill a bucket that's full of holes as long as the walls of Jerusalem remain in rubble. What I think is that the original resettlers, they had hoped that rebuilding the temple would be enough. If enough offerings are made at the temple, if enough worshipers went back, then wouldn't God just do the rest, making people flourish? But here we have Hanani's report. Hanani is a deeply spiritual person, a prophet that God used, someone who understands spiritual matters, but he says that what the people need is an investment in this secular infrastructure, the restoration of the walls and gates. And this update 
is something that wrecks Nehemiah. Verse 4 tells us, when I heard this, I sat down and I wept. In fact, for days I mourned, I fasted and prayed to the God of heaven. Because Nehemiah was probably ready to give encouragement, ready to lead a big fundraising effort to send another resupply team to Jerusalem. But Hanani and the other travelers, they have just reported that the additional money that he was ready to give will be useless as long as the walls and gates of Jerusalem remain in ruins. So Nehemiah is weeping as he hears the situation is so bad that your generosity cannot make a meaningful difference. Nehemiah is told something bigger than you needs to help. A bigger, a greater grace is needed. And that, my friends, is the first step to praying like Nehemiah. You have to humble yourself when you hear about people's problems. And you have to recognize that this situation requires more than what I can give. This situation requires something that only God can provide, and that is the meaning of fasting with mourning. After hearing about what other people are going through, when they tell you what makes them brokenhearted, you must respond with fasting with mourning. It means that you're not jumping to solve the problems of others. You don't assume that people lack the wisdom and strength that you have. You recognize that their problems are complicated, multi-layered, and that no course of action can guarantee success. I love the way Nehemiah prays because it lets us know that it's completely normal to not know what to pray for other people in the midst of a crisis. It tells us that incoherent prayer the prayer of just groaning before God, that that comes first. That vulnerable prayer of surrender where you experience spiritual poverty and you just beg God for help, that must happen first. Where you trust God with your problem and then you begin to listen for God's guidance. Before you try to st sound smart as you're praying, before you try to grasp for control by prescribing an action, you must take time to be still, be still and silent at least for minutes, at least for hours in the case of catastrophic crisis for days. Remember that after they heard about Job's problems, his friends just mourned and sat in silence with them for seven days and seven nights. Erase all of your anxious thoughts, all of your reactionary thoughts, be still. Honor God and ask God in the situation, what is your plan? What do you want? And then patiently wait for the Holy Spirit to lead you. God will guide you. You will begin to sense God's plan when you stop caring about your power and your righteousness. And when God reveals that plan to you, God will ask you to say it back to him. In that moment of surrender, after you're just begging God, then God will begin to formulate a plan to you, and then he will say, hey, say it back to me. This process is demonstrated in the award-winning TV show, The Night Agent. I highly recommend that you watch it. A woman named Lo Rose Larkin calls a special hotline after her aunt and uncle are murdered. She explains to the FBI agent Peter Sutherland her problems. And through Peter's questions, Rose is able to process what is happening. And then since he's the security expert, he comes up with a plan and gives guidance to Rose. And this is part of that dialogue. He says, if we get separated, we're going to need a place to meet up. Yeah, yeah, a meetup spot. There's a place just east of Canal and Foxall, right? It's a park. It's called Foundry Branch. Find a pedestrian tunnel and go through it. You'll find a pier. I used to fish on it with my dad when I was a kid and make sure you're not being followed, okay? Watch your tails. And Rose responds, okay, I feel like such a spy now. She chuckles. Peter smiles. And then he gets serious and says, say it back to me. Where are we going if we get split up? And then he nods with approval as Rose responds, uh, Foundry Branch, take the tunnel to the pier, check for tails. So like Rose, after we vent and state our problems, we will hear and sense the leading of God. And that's our job to say it back to God. So between verses 4 and 5, 
It's as if God had asked Nehemiah, okay, this is the plan, and now I want you to say it back to me. What am I asking you to do? That's when Nehemiah moves to the formal prayer of supplication that culminates in asking God for help. But before saying back God's plan in verse 11, Nehemiah goes through all of the steps of prayer, which I'm sure you're familiar with. I see the ACTS model demonstrated here, A-C-T-S. We begin with adoration in verse 5. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. Here, Nehemiah is saying, I adore you, I honor you. You are God, you have the answers that we need. You are the one that we trust because great are your promises and we're banking on them. And that adoration begins all of our prayers. And then C, confession. Nehemiah conf- continues with confession in verses 6 and 7. Listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. If we are growing in holiness at all, we will grow in our sensitivity to our sin. We will see all the wrongs that we have done. We, have, we will see all the good things that we have left undone. Nehemiah takes time to confess the sins of his people, his family, and himself. But the goal of confession is not to beat yourself up, but to then turn to the promise that if we confess our sins, God will forgive us and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. So Nehemiah goes from confession to claiming forgiveness and blessing in verse 9. He's saying, God, you promised. You said to our answers, but if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. So when we move from the prayer of surrender where we're just mourning and telling God what we can do, as we sense God's plan for us and as we begin to pray back to him, we begin with adoration, then we confess, then we thank God for our forgiveness, and that leads us to supplication. And Nehemiah goes into that prayer of supplication in verse 11. This is where Nehemiah asks God to bless him. Oh Lord, please hear my prayer Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. Because while he was praying and listening, Nehemiah received a plan to leverage his connection to the king so that he can secure the resources and most importantly, the permission, the authority to rebuild the walls. And Nehemiah is going to ask for that permission to go and supervise the project himself. This plan is something that Nehemiah receives after he spends the days fasting, and after he asked God for help, God gave him this plan, and now he's saying it back to God, and that is why he can pray with such boldness. Please grant me success today. Make the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. So what does it mean to pray like Nehemiah? to pray with boldness, to trust that God will move as you pray, what does it mean to pray like that? It means to not trust in yourself, to not be focused on your strategy or your resources or your power or what you can do for others. You lay all that down. What does Nehemiah do? He begins by extending hospitality and then hearing from the people that he loves the deep problems that they're carrying, the problems that humble him, that make him feel poor, that make him realize, I can't solve their problems, I can't do it for them. And from that place of humility and surrender, as he is agonizing before God, saying, the people I love are unable to take care of themselves, oh God, would you please move? From that place, he begins to hear God's plan and provision. And because it's God's plan, That is why he can say it back to God with boldness, with passion, and say, God, please bless this work. How can we do it? 
How can you pray to God and say, God, please bless it. I trust you to bless it. What will give you that conviction? You will only have true conviction if you humble yourself and present your heart as helpless, if you experience spiritual poverty and say, God, I don't know what to do. It's only after you do that that you will begin to hear what God has already planned. And after you understand God's plan, that's when you can say it back to God with boldness. Why do we feel like we're manufacturing boldness when we pray? Why do we feel like we're trying to psych ourselves up when we pray and saying, amen, amen? Why do we sound like we are shouting, trying to convince ourselves? It's because we don't pray like Nehemiah. We try to jump to that prayer of supplication without the days of mourning and fasting and admitting our powerlessness, admitting our mixed motives, admitting the pride and the desire for control that's driving us to pray. It's only when we recognize all that and silence within ourselves every voice of self-righteousness that we begin to sense God's leading. And from there, we're able to pray with conviction, which leads to power and effectiveness. It is only those who admit their powerlessness that are able to experience power, passion, and conviction in prayer. There is no shortcut. There is no formula that you can follow that allows you to pray in a way that God answers. You must go the long way, which always begins with loving the people that God has called you to love, extending hospitality to them so that they begin to tell you all the things that you are afraid to ask about because their problems make you aware that you are poor because you don't have the wisdom or resources to solve their problems for them and you love them. And you become brokenhearted as you hear about what they're going through. And you allow that to allow you to be filled with poverty of spirit before God. And that is where you begin to pray. May it be that hospitality will lead you to curiosity, which will allow you to hear the things that make you realize how poor you are as you realize what the people that you love are going through. That is where we begin to pray. May you have the days of incoherent prayer that follow after news of crisis. And as you learn to weep and fast and mourn before God there, may you begin to sense God's plan and provision. And may that be the reason you begin to pray with conviction, passion, and power, praying in a way that God moves, praying like Nehemiah. Would you pray with me? God, in this summer, there has been much going and coming. We had opportunities to reconnect with people that we love, but we were afraid to reconnect. We were afraid to ask the real questions because we are afraid of experiencing poverty of spirit. We are afraid to ask how people are doing. We are afraid to open ourselves to those conversations because we are afraid of what they might share. Because we care for them, because we're supposed to love them, we're afraid of what they will share because we think that we are responsible for them. But God, would you teach us to take every opportunity to hear what people are going through, not because we have the solutions for them, not because we have easy answers for them, but even though we are foolish and even though we are poor, we have the willingness to listen to them and love them and bear witness to their pain to cry out to you and ask for your salvation. God, would you help us to trust that it is only after we think and we pray for people that we begin to be able to sense your plans, begin to be able to pray in a way that experiences your power. God, would you teach us how to honor people around us? They don't want to talk to us. They don't want to tell us their struggles because they think we will jump to offering a solution. and They don't want to burden us that way. They don't want to tell us about their struggles because they think that that will be admitting that we are greater than them, that they're asking for our intervention when they're not. What they really want is for someone to pray with them, to be feeling poor with them, to beg God with them so that God's hand will move, and so that God will answer and provide. But God, we don't know how to pray like that. That is not our habit. 
We like to pray with the heart of donors, with people who think, I can give to that cause. I can write a check. I can give some time. God, would you teach us how to have the heart of Nehemiah so that despite all of our privilege, despite the fact that we live in our own Susa, that we can care about the things that are happening in Israel with a humble heart, with a broken heart, a heart that you can work through because it's a heart marked by poverty of spirit. Give us that heart so that we can experience prayer and help us to learn to pray as we study Nehemiah this month. All these things we pray in Christ's name.